Hello and welcome to episode 226 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrodin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine, USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other assignments. Welcome back, Bill. Thank and you, how are you, Seth. You know, it's funny because um, we watched two episodes in a row as we're recording this today um, where I wasn't there and it was you and John. Now, though, several episodes will have aired with me since then, but those two episodes were recorded on the same day, and that was the day I was, you know, filming all those Titan um, midget submarine news spots. So, um, it's uh, I'm happy to be back, and uh, you know, we are trying to use a new recording uh, software program today, so uh, viewers. Listeners won't be affected by it, but viewers, you if it looks funky, we're still getting used to the new system. So I hope uh, it goes well. I'm sure it will. And if it doesn't, we'll fudge it so exactly. nobody will ever know. But <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> that's right. Before we get started, um, as we've been doing in the last several episodes, we do want to ask you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel as it does help others find our show. Um, one of the comments was many of the comments we see often are, you know, I can't believe you guys don't have more subscribers. Well, the best way to do that is for you guys who are watching it, who aren't subscribed to do that very thing. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, once you subscribe and like the videos, that helps you to push out the, the videos to other people. And, uh, you know, we want to get the history to the masses. So that's the easiest way we know how to get it done. So we would appreciate it very much. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. On with the show. Uh, so to, to this point in the war, the majority of the fighting on land has taken place in the South Pacific at places like Guadalcanal, New Georgia, and Bougainville. All of these places were captured via amphibious landing. All of them were against meager Japanese defenses, or in some cases, none at all. Uh, the previous landings had gone exceedingly well with meager casualties to the assault forces, leaving American planners for a new offensive in a new area of the Pacific to feel optimistic about the chance of knocking the main island of an atoll in an area of the Gilbert Islands out rather quickly. The Americans had been building forces, shepherding ships and men from literally across the globe, funneling them all to Pearl Harbor in order to execute this very offensive. The forces amassing in Pearl Harbor were destined to be the spearhead of the new offensive in the Pacific that was based off of decades old plans and also destined to be the guinea pigs for the amphibious doctrine that the United States Navy and Marine Corps had been planning for years and slowly fine-tuning in the, quote, warm-up assaults that had thus far taken place in the Pacific. A tremendous amount rode on the success of this upcoming operation. Succeed in the Navy's amphibious doctrine and the plans laid down in War Plan Orange of how the United States would prosecute a war against Japan would be proven worthy and would dictate the remainder of the planned offensives in the war against Imperial Japan fail and the Navy would sit at square one with few backups and little confidence in their suggestions going forward. Fail and future amphibious assaults such as those being planned in Europe for places like Anzio and more importantly Normandy would all have to be rewritten and as a result would possibly put the liberation of mainland Europe off by another year or more. This inaugural operation of what would eventually be called the Central Pacific Drive would be vastly different than anything thus far undertaken in the PTO. It'd be the first assault against a heavily fortified beach, the first assault on a coral atoll, the first assault since Guadalcanal without the benefit of the land-based aerial umbrella, and the first assault utilizing self-sustaining large-scale amphibious expeditionary units. A campaign in the Gilbert Islands with the goal of capturing Tarawa Atoll, specifically Batio, would be named Operation Galvanic and its success or failure would dictate the prosecution of the remainder of the war in both the Pacific and Europe. Bill, this is a ridiculously important operation. This has, you know, the fingerprints of Admiral King, Admiral Nimitz, all over it. And this is a significant operation in terms of what it, you know, portrays for the rest of the war. But it starts in a place where, you know, we don't necessarily think that it would start, which of course is the Gilbert Islands. So, Bill, why the why the Gilbert Islands? You know why the Gilbert yeah, Islands? Well, in the first if I place? Bring, can bring up the map, Seth. You know you see the strategic importance of the Gilberts right here. We've got um, 
Tarawa right down here. And, um, you know, I'm sorry. That's, let's see. Is that coming through? <laughs> Maybe it's not. Okay. So it is. Okay. So Tarawa right down here. And, you know, with it, here's the Solomons. Most of our activity has been down here. Let's, let's remember Rabal is there. And what we're trying to do is advance up because the Marianas eventually are the place we need to be in order to hit mainland Japan. As we described in our episode with Admiral Cox, the only way we were able to hit mainland Japan to this point was, was by hopping over the Himalayas and flying bombing missions out of um, China. And that clearly was not going to be a long-term solution for any of us. And so the Marianas is the, is the answer, but to get there, we need to kind of hop step by step. Seth, maybe it would help if you put this Operation Galvanic in context with what was happening in the European theater at this point. We've already said that Solomon's predated Northern Africa landings, and, and, you, and you mentioned Anzio. Where are we in, in Operation Galvanic with respect to the landings at Anzio? So right now, well, Anzio doesn't come off until, you know, of course, until mm -hmm. 1944, but or early 1944. But the thing is, is in 1943, November specifically is what we're looking at now. You know, we had already been on Sicily where, you know, we'd already conquered Sicily. Uh, we'd already landed at Salerno. We're fighting up the deadly boot, up the bloody boot in Italy, as it were. And um, we're making our way northwards. But the thing is, is that in this stage of the war, 1943, while the United States' um, industrial might is starting to, well, it's not starting, it is flexing its muscles, there are still a lot of things that the allies, specifically us, the United States, do not have great quantities of. And we're going to get to those very specific mm -hmm. things here in just a couple minutes. But this operation was, you know, the the brainchild of, and we're going to get in a real deep discussion on that in just a few minutes. But this operation was the brainchild of people that had thought about this way back in the 19 teens, uh, or not specifically this operation, but the drive, the offense of the Central Pacific Drive is what it's going to be called. And there was so much that hinged on this, and there were so little resources in terms of specific things like transports, which you would think that the United States, you know, in your mind, you think of Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, California, pumping out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Liberty ships, and they did. But by 1943, at this stage, that that juggernaut was just starting to get moving. So the supply situation in terms of shipping, and, and we're going to get to why this is so important, wasn't as plentiful as one would might expect in November 1943. So when you looked at that, when you look at the map that you just pulled up, Bill, with the Gilbert Islands in it, mm -hmm. there we go. I can see it now. If you look at it, it looks like Tara was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Because, I mean, you know, you got the Solomons down there and then you got Tara where you just do the arrow on there. And then, you know, the Marianas and Guam are way over to the west. And Tarawa and, and, and Macon Island, which is north above it. And by the way, just to be clear, uh, the capture of Macon Island and Beatio were all part of Operation Galvanic. For the next couple of episodes, we're only going to focus on Beatio, though, just so everybody's abundantly clear. Um, the Gilberts lie in what is called Micronesia, in the eastern portion of Micronesia, mostly a backwater until November 1943. The Gilberts have been captured from Great Britain by the Japanese on December 8th, 1941. Uh, there was no fight in the Gilberts, uh, as the Brits had neglected to protect the islands. There were only a few New Zealand coast watchers there, most of whom were evacuated, and those who were unfortunate enough to still be there when the Japanese came were captured. Um, but, you know... When you look at the map, it looks like it lies in the middle of nowhere, but really Tarawa lies in the middle of everything. And and we've got some mileage here to to distinguish this. Tarawa lies now Tarawa Atoll, mind you, lies 290 miles from Mili, and that that's one of the Japanese large Japanese bases in the area. 540 miles from Kwajalein, 1305 miles from Truk. 1,285 miles from Rabaul, 1,005 miles from Guadalcanal, 1,720 miles from Midway, 2,390 miles from Pearl Harbor. So while you think it looks like it lies in the middle of nowhere, it actually lies in the middle of everything. And, and, it's, and it's a very important location, so important that 
the Joint Chiefs of Staff actually approve the operation that we're about to talk about. Um, you know, like every other operation that had been fought over thus far in the Pacific, this whole island campaign here in the Gilberts was fought over an airfield. And, you know, in early 1942, the Japanese built an airstrip. It was very, very crude, but there was an airstrip on Beishio specifically, which immediately put Beishio in the crosshairs, in the target list of the United States as we we're starting to go through the Pacific. Uh, you know, and not so much that Beishio was going to be a strong Japanese mm -hmm. bomber base or anything like that. You know, it did have aircraft there, and those aircraft did or could interdict uh, Allied shipping going in between that area right there. It was more important to the Allies to capture, not from, not to deny the Japanese the ability to fly off of there, but to allow us to fly off of Beishio. Uh, the Japanese force of aircraft that were on Beishio was not strong. It was not significant, but the island, as we just demonstrated, was located in such a central locale that we felt that it was important enough to capture so that we could protect, have this aerial umbrella of land-based aircraft for future operations. But Bill, this was not a, you know, a once, you know, a, like boom, thought, think about this and let's do this operation. This is actually the Central Pacific Drive. This which this operation is the opening, is the first thing. And it came, right. goes way back and, in um, the 20s. You know, we mentioned the Macon raid, you know, that was the Carlson raid launched from submarines in a separate previous episode. And we talked about the fact that, you know, it was a great disaster. The one thing that it did achieve, however, uh, you remember we did the raid because we thought that that was the center of gravity of the Japanese presence in this area. And it turned out, of course, the Japanese center of gravity was Tarawa. One thing that the Macon Ray did achieve is the Japanese decided, well, we better strengthen our presence, our defenses in th this area, and specifically where their center of gravity was, which was Tarawa. So, you know, they dug in, they built very robust defenses, reinforced concrete, pillboxes, even the what you might think are silly coconut log um, pillboxes and things like that that were covered with sand, and they were extremely hardened. And so despite the fact that there is a relatively small Japanese force here, and we'll get to the numbers in a second, and the, 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 despite the fact that we decided we were going to take it, it was strategic and we were going to take it, this became a uh, substantially more difficult fight than it otherwise might have been, Seth. Absolutely. And, and you know, again, if you look at the map and, you, you know, now we've, we've kind of laid out the distances and you understand why it's significant in terms of strategic location. But this wasn't a one, you know, just top of mind, hey, let's go take Tarawa because there's an airfield there. I mean, that was part of it. But this was all filtered back into a plan that had been made to fight the Japanese as early as the 1900, the early 1900s, and the astute listeners that that listen and that or watch our show are immediately saying, "Ah, yeah, I know what you're talking about." Of course, it's mm -hmm. War Plan Orange, Bill. We've never we've we've kind of danced around War Plan Orange, you know, on different episodes of the show, but we've never really kind of dug deep into it. And I don't want to get mm -hmm. too damn deep into it, but we do need to explain it here because this is what forces. I say forces. This is what outlines literally everything that we do from now until the Philippines, really, and actually, right. and even after that. But so t tell us well, about you know, what we're Then, like now, we always start any contingency pla planning by wargaming and doing other things that cause us to adopt a basic framework for a war plan. In the United States nowadays, we have something called O plans, operations plans, if it's a very robust plan where we have tip fids, time, phase, force, deployment um, directives that talk about the logistics flow of forces into the theater. And we have con plans, which are just concept plans. We do those for lower probability events, things that may happen, but we don't put the detailed planning in place in case they do happen. Well, in those days, we did the same thing. We didn't call them con plans or O plans. We called them war plans. And 
excuse me, War Plan Orange was adopted by the Joint Army and Navy Board actually in 1924, Seth, and allowed for the war in the Pacific to be prosecuted mm -hmm. by the United States alone. That's a key point. Even today, we frequently decide, you know what, we're going we're gonna to hope our allies join us for whatever campaign we're planning for, but we can't rely on the allies joining us. Therefore, we're going to conduct, the, we're going to generate contingency plans, assuming that we're fighting by ourselves. And that's what War Plan Orange was back then as well. It's not unlike the Japanese war plan, was called Kantai Kesen, a decisive battle on the high seas against the, on our side, it was going to be a decisive battle on the high seas against the Imperial Japanese combined fleet, Seth. Right. And, and you know, it, when you read some of the outlines for War Play in Orange as how it was assumed the war would go, it's strangely similar to how the <laughs> war actually went. And, and the fact that this plan was written, like you said, you know, as early as 1909 and then, you know, adopted in the 1920s, it's mm -hmm. kind of eerie, really, how things shake out. The original plan assumed that a Japanese blockade, it's a blockade now, of the Philippines and other assorted American outposts across the Pacific would kick off the war. Uh, these outposts were expected to hold out on their own. Yeah. Does that sound yeah. familiar? No. <laughs> Philippines? It did not Wake assume Island? Pearl Harbor would, be, would fall. But yeah, the Philippines would be the, no. the tripwire in essence. Yep. And it, once this occurred, the Pacific fleet would either sail from California or Hawaii, and would then head to Guam, then the Philippines, then destroy the combined fleet on the seas, and then proceed to blockade the Japanese home islands. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. So following the war games and fleet problems of 1933, in which the Pacific fleet was, quote, destroyed, uh, War Plan Orange was then revised to implement a different strategy. Now, one of the things that was present in this uh, war games and, and fleet problems in 1933 were, of course, aircraft carriers. Um, the original plan still assumed a Philippine blockade and losing several Western Pacific outposts to the Japanese, but instead of an almighty Kantai Kesson on the high seas, the U.S. plan now focused on the U.S. fleet based in Pearl Harbor, mm, slowly methodically taking Japanese island outpost after outpost, focusing on the Marshall Islands as the main target. Uh, the reasons for this were by methodically advancing across the Pacific, the U.S. fleet would, it was assumed that the U.S. fleet would, would, be damaged, not necessarily destroyed, but be damaged and would need repair and therefore acquiring bases in a stepping stone across the Pacific will allow the fleet to, to dock there, to be home ported there and, and be repaired there. Um, the logistic issues involved in the great expanse of the Pacific would force the United States to move slowly through and build supplies and supply lines as they advanced. I mean, does yeah. any of this sound familiar to anybody? It's exactly again, this what is we why did. Moving the fleet to Pearl Harbor was the right idea at the time. You know, and a lot of people, including the CNO, right. Richardson at the time, criticized it. He wanted to keep the fleet bottled up in San Diego. And, and that would have been the right move if we were planning to, if the, if the Navy existed to protect itself. Because San Diego was a defensive home port, not an offensive home port. You pull back when you're trying to protect the fleet. But if you're gonna, if your only objective is protecting the fleet, what's the point of having it? Now that was the theory. In fact, you know, we also have to say that the, the failure of imagination. We didn't imagine that the Japanese would be able to conduct a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. If we imagined that, we might have been a little bit more defensive in the early phases of the war before we got offenses. But again, taking yourself back to the late 1930s, moving the fleet to Pearl Harbor in anticipation of the, Philipp the Philippines falling was exactly the right move. But the idea was for the fleet not to get destroyed. Ultimately, yeah, that is always the goal, isn't it? But, you know, you go back to what I just said. I said that the ultimate goal in 1933 was the Marshall Islands. And, of course, we're talking about Kwajalein, Roy Namor, places like that, which we are eventually going to take. But uh, the Marshall Islands, you know, they're not necessarily uber strategic, but that what they do have are deep water natural ports. Uh, Majoro is one. And as the war progresses, you're going to hear a lot 
about Majuro. You know, I mean, this is where the carriers, this murderers row. This is, this is where the U.S. fleet tanks up, you know, for, for quite a bit of the time in the 1944-45 era. Um, you know, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the plan was again revised with the goal of still methodically proceeding across the Central Pacific and acquiring deep water ports, as I just said, but now also involved the addition of island outposts that could house airstrips so that any further advance westwards could and would be under a near continuous aerial umbrella. Remember that, because Tarawa, Batio, whatever you make in Galvanic, Operation Galvanic, does not, will not, and never would have a constant aerial umbrella. The only way to provide that umbrella was with aircraft carriers. And we're going to get to that in just a second, too. So, Bill, as the war progresses, as, and I'm talking about the actual war, not mm -hmm. war plan orange, but the actual war, technology advances. And I mean, that's, you know, with any war. There was one specific aircraft that was being, that had, been being developed and was under development and was going through a lot of growing pains right now that really changed the nature of how and why. And I know we're going to get arguments on this, but this is the God's honest truth. This is how and why the Central Pacific Drive developed as it actually did. And of course, that's I'm talking about the Boeing right. P-29, the Superfort. The Superfortress is what drove the operations that come after Tarawa all the way to the end of the yeah. war, right, Bill? So we don't we don't focus on the marshals. We start focusing Just on like the Marianas great now. shipbuilding. Uh, ratchet was ratcheted up prior to December seventh, right? We started going crazy with our shipbuilding before the war actually began. Same thing happened with the B twenty nines. We ordered large numbers of B twenty nines as early as May May nineteen forty one, months before. Pearl Harbor was, was bombed. We knew something was going to happen. We didn't know exactly where and exactly when. So this is so by mid 1943, while the Marshalls were still a prominent target of American plans for logistic reasons, that the, the Marshalls were a prominent target of American plans for logistic reasons. The Marianas, which was going to be the jumping off point for the B-29s became the focal point for offensive reasons. So we need both the logistics and the launch pads for the attack on the Japanese home islands because the Marianas would allow the B-29s to strike the home islands, Seth. Yeah, and, and we're going to, obviously, we're going to talk about the B-29 raids on the home islands, you know, when we get to 1945. But just to suffice it to say that, you know, initially, as Bill had alluded to in the beginning, uh, you know, we were thinking that the B-29s could fly out of China and, you know, could attack Japan from there. And they did for a little while, but we realized pretty quickly that that was an untenable situation, that the supply situation in China and the airfield situation was just not going to lend itself to that. So therefore the Marianas had to be the strategic point from which we could start strategic bombing on the home islands of Japan. And of course, this is what eventually brings the war to an end. That being said, doctrine in 1943, uh, relied heavily on the influence of land-based air protection. And this is even Admiral Nimitz and the United States Navy's doctrine at this time. It was known that, that the Pacific Fleet could and would provide air cover, but the carriers could not be anchored in any one location for a long period of time. Doing this would open them up to Japanese submarine, aircraft, and surface force attacks. Not unlike what Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher was complaining about off the coast of Guadalcanal mm -hmm. in August 1942. Very, very, very similar situation here. Therefore, the carrier base support would be there as the fleet advanced, but more substantial, longer leg, and more sustainable land-based aerial protection would be needed. Therefore, islands like Batio would be needed to be were needed to be captured so that they could further support operations in the Marshalls, which is going to be the next target area right here. And I'm spending a lot of time on this, and we're, and we're talking about this deeply because ever since Tarawa concluded. In November 1943, people have said it was unnecessary, and then it's completely untrue. Yeah, the things it's completely untrue. It is yeah, very and, and people. Necessary. I think a lot, most people get that you know, despite the large number, and we, we you know, spoiler alert, you know, this doesn't go well for us. And I think a lot of people recognize that it greatly affected our amphibious doctrine in the Pacific. What I think people understand less of 
is it, in, it affected our amphibious doctrine writ large, not just in the Pacific, but the Atlantic too. And in that regard, it has substantial cascading effects on how amphibious operations are conducted in Europe. So it's not just uh, you know, an issue with the Pacific. And I think Admiral King understood this. He's the one who really pushed the advance across the Central Pacific to the JCS, almost begging the JCS begrudgingly approved the limited buildup in the Pacific, seeing as how the proposed Normandy invasion had already been postponed until 1944. So the JCS granted King permission to build forces and launch the Central Pacific Drive within a limited time frame, that being late 43, early 44, because they didn't want to tie up all this amphibious shipping um, into the period where they thought that European landings might occur. So without actually saying it, but heavily implying it, the JCS did allude to the fact that King's offensive had better show gains early in the process or the limited forces allocated to him in his Pacific project would be yank, yanked and sent back to Europe. So, Seth, that's a, that's a metric uh, ton of stuff that rode on what would soon be called this Operation Galvanic, isn't it? It is. It is a boatload of material, boatload of weight on uh, Admiral King, Admiral Nimitz, and soon to be Admiral, well, he already is an Admiral, but soon to be overall commander of the Operation Admiral Spruance. We'll get to him in a second, too. Um, you know, the fact that, and I, I said this just a, just a couple minutes ago, the fact that the United States, while the industrial juggernaut was churning, and, and it was, we actually had to, we being the Pacific, actually had to borrow, no lie, borrow ships from the European theater to conduct this operation. And by ships, I'm talking about transports and logistical support vessels and the like. And, you know, it's it's hard to believe, but it's actually God's honest truth that a lot of the ships that took part in this operation were funneled through the Panama Canal or directed to the Pacific on their way to Europe to take part in this operation just because we did not have enough of them at that time. And that's, that's something that I don't think a lot of people know or understand is that you know, the, the, the fleet that you see, and I'm talking about the invasion fleets that you see for, for the Marianas and places like that, mm -hmm. those weren't there in 1943, like the size of them. They just they just weren't. They were not there yet. So in order to kick this operation off, that's why we say King almost begged to get this done because he had to get the supplies that he needed. And I'm not talking guns and bullets and stuff like that. I'm talking about the ships to get the guns and the mm -hmm. bullets to the Gilbert Islands. He actually had to beg and damn near borrow and steal to get these things out there. So there's a ton of material and, and a ton of weight riding on this entire operation. If this operation yeah, fails, and this is the key takeaway point. And the problem, yeah, yeah, the problem Seth, ahead, is that the, the science of oceanography was still a developing science at this point in time. We didn't know as much about, uh, you know, um, tides as we should have in order to conduct an operation like this and, and to compound the, the problem, Tarawa and Basio is a coral atoll. And as such, the United States had not yet invaded any coral atoll like this. And with that proposition came several hurdles that had to be met before the landing could be successful. Now, uh, I, I'm going to do a little bit of hydrographic lesson here for the for the viewers, and I I'm going to try to describe it to the best I, I can to um, to the folks that are listening to the audio broadcast. But but we're going to learn a little bit about tides. Now I'm going to bring up a map here because I failed to prepare adequately to bring up a sheet of uh, plain paper. But I'm going to end up drawing on this map for those of you. Forgive me for doing this, but as you know. Tides are cyclical, right? High tide, low tide is the water level, okay? Normally, I think that the, the concept between high and low tides were well understood by oceanographers of the day. So you've got the difference between high tide and low tide. And of course, the objective is if you've got a reef bottom here, you want as much water as possible between the bottom of your boat and the reef as you go over the reef. Now there's this concept called neap tide. And what happens is the earth 
The, the tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon, okay? So the moon pulls like this, and it causes the water level on the side of the earth that's facing the moon to increase. However, if the sun is basically perpendicular to the moon, the moon's pulling in one direction, and the sun's pulling in a different direction, and what ends up happening is the high tides and low tides, instead of being uh, extreme, they're moderated. So the high tide is not quite as high, and the low tide is not quite as low. Now, if you're depending on this high tide in order to get over a reef, and it turns out what's actually happening is a neap tide, that means you're not going to have as much water over that reef as you had hoped. And so I apologize for the uh, hydrographic and oceanographic lesson here, but it's important to understand those factors uh, at, to understand what went wrong at Tarawa and understand why the Navy decided to develop these things called undersea, underwater demolitions teams or UDTs, the precursors to the SEALs that we'll see deployed in places like Iwo later in the war. But we didn't have those guys yet. And so uh, take us right, through right. what happened here in this situation. So, so people are going to sit there and say, why the hell is, you know, did you go into this detailed description of tides? But it's, it's, the tides are inextricably linked yeah. to Batio. You know, it, it, people think immediately when they think because of the low tide, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the low tide at Batio, you know, Marines were essentially, you know, butchered. And while that is true to some extent, and we'll get into the details in that in another episode, uh, just to be clear, we're actually doing three episodes on Tarawa. It's that important. This is the setup. Um, you know, the tides are what what dictated everything that happened here at Tarawa from the setup to the implementation to the aftermath. And to Bill's point, you know, tides were understood, but the hydrographic details on Batio specifically were not understood at all, really. Uh, no significant tidal information on Batio existed anywhere at all on the planet Earth. What tidal information was predicted was actually extrapolated from Australian tides, Chile, and Samoa. No lie. That's how the United States Navy predicted or tried to predict what was going to happen with the tide situation at Tarawa. And again, because of the, the reef that surrounded Tarawa, they knew that there was going to be an issue trying to get over said reef. At low tide, the reef is exposed and at the very least shallow and completely surrounded the island, which was, by the way, Batio, flat as a pancake. The tide on Batio for the period of the invasion now set for November 20th, 1943, was predicted, based on what we just talked about, to be rising when the Marines landed. And at that stage, the water over the reef would be at least five feet deep, which was a foot more than the four foot draft Higgins boats needed to get over that very same reef. That being said, Batio had a notoriously fickle tide pattern. And, and in November, according to New Zealanders who had lived there before the war, they said, hey, we don't have any specific data on this, but just so you know, the tides in, uh, on Batio specifically, <laughs> they don't necessarily often cooperate with what you think they're going to do. At certain stages of the moon, like Bill was saying, the tide surrounding Batio would reef would just sit there. No rise, mm -hmm. no fall. And if Batio was it experienced what was called an apogean neap tide, which it did, there would only be three feet of water, which would not allow the Higgins boats to cross the reef and deposit the men ashore. And this is incredibly important, and we're going to get to this in a second, I swear. The invading Marines would have to wade through the water some six to 800 yards all the way to the beach, directly into the sights of Japanese machine gunners waiting for them. Bill, that sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, but the United States Navy, and specifically the United States Marine Corps, thought they had an ace up their sleeve, didn't they? Well, uh, there was deal. a device built specifically for situations like this. And you all know it by the name Amtrak, which actually stands for amphibious tractor. Some people called it the alligator. Uh, the vehicle was technically known as an LVT or landing vehicle tank. And so the, the, the Amtrak would crawl it, could, it was amphibious, so it could swim in water, and it could crawl up on the beach. So if there is a reef 
you know, obstruction, theoretically, it could climb up and over that reef, as well as swimming through the, the water. So it was thought that the LVTs could get the Marines over the reef, regardless of the tidal stage, and get the initial assault waves ashore in rapid order, thus securing the beach before the Higgins boats landed. If, for God, if, God forbid, the Marines had to wade ashore from the Higgins boats, the assault force riding the LVT, the LVTs could just go back and forth, and you know, hopefully the Marines that have already landed with the Am Amtraks would have reduced the Japanese beach defenses, thus allowing wading Marines a wet but secure way to shore, or the Amtraks could shuttle those wading Marines back and forth to the beach. Or so it was thought, Seth. That was the that was the thought, and and the LVTs, as you'll see, and anybody who knows about Taro, I mean, we're not giving something away here, but the LVTs play a huge role, and they do exactly what they were designed to do. Um, but that doesn't solve the question of the reef and the low tide issue. Um, now back to the LVTs specifically. Before Batio, LVTs had been used as logistical vehicles that had carried supplies to the Marines inland on tropical islands. They were used at Guadalcanal. Uh, there were LVT-1s on Guadalcanal. Hell, there was one that was wrecked and or disabled or whatever you want to call it in the middle of Alligator Creek during the Tenerife River Battle on August 21st. So, I mean, these things were around and they did carry some Marines ashore at uh, Bougainville, which had occurred, of course, on November the 1st, 1943. Um, these things had minimal armor. Uh, the LVT-1 is what I'm talking about specifically. And they were not initially designed for assaults. So, the LVT, and this is why, the LVTs were prone to engine failure if the electrical solenoids became wet with salt water. And a stranded LVT often results in a sunken LVT. And if you have a vehicle, Bill, that you're relying to get men to shore in a saltwater environment and your solenoids can get wet and strand your vehicle, that's yeah, not, not, it's, it's, it's kind of a problem, forward. isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly true. The second amphibious tractor battalion in New Zealand had about 100 LVTs, uh, LVT-1s, but of those, only 75 were going to be available for the assault on Batio. Colonel Drews, the battalion commander, stated that his vehicles could transport the Marines ashore if they were up-armored and had defensive weapons added to them. But the problem is these LVTs had kind of borderline reserve buoyancy as it stands, and anything you do to up armor and put additional weapons on them actually reduces the reserve buoyancy and makes it even easier to sink. And it's already too easy to sink. So in an attempt to get these LVT-1s ready for the upcoming operation, sheet steel was welded to the front, just the front, of the vehicles. And additional weapons were added as well, including two 50 caliber uh, machine guns as well as 30 caliber guns. Uh, and Seth, you know, there's an additional LVT-2 type of uh, vehicle that was available too, right? Yes, there were. And, and the, the Marines, specifically General Julian Smith, and we're going to talk about him in a second too, 2nd Marine Division commanding officer, knew full well that, that these vehicles were more than likely going to play a vital role in the operation. And while Bill, just what Bill said, there were 100 or so, 75 actually, LVT ones available in New Zealand, you knew we needed more than that. Uh, the LVT twos, which were uh, had a bit more armor, a bit more power, or a little bit faster, and by that I mean like a knot faster. Um, they were the newer model of the LVT, uh, hence the name LVT two. Uh, they were sitting literally on a pier in San Diego, awaiting transport. These vehicles, I believe, there were about a hundred or so of those as well. Um, or Shanghai, like straight up Shanghai by uh, General Howland Mad Smith and General Julian Smith of the 2nd Marine Division and directly shipped to the amphibious tractor battalion aboard slow moving LSTs that left the United States and met the invasion fleet at sea in the days before the invasion. That's how touch and go this was. That's how badly they were needed, how much they, how much faith they put in these vehicles specifically to help with this operation. And again, goes back to our original point, the actual status of the American you know, uh, supply situation is that these things are sitting on the pier and they were shipped directly to uh, the 2nd Marine Division for this operation, literally stolen off the damn pier and brought to them. 
So in the eyes of the Marines and Na Marine and Navy planners, the addition of now some 125 LVTs sealed the deal on the landings. Reef or no reef, the LVTs would make the difference. And if the men had to wade ashore, it would be hopefully not under yeah, but fire. Hope is not a strategy, Seth, of course. <laughs> and, you know, again, no. spoiler alert, that's not the way it worked out. So, you know, Admiral Nimitz chose his chief of staff, Admiral Raymond Spruance, to lead Operation Galvanic. And so Spruance was steady, cool, centered, low key. He had all the attributes that uh, almost a mirror image of Nimitz in personality in that regard. He'd already seen major combat at Midway and won the biggest victory in, you know, Navy history to that point at Midway. And, but that wasn't, in fact, his only major battle command, yet he was really trusted by Nimitz. Nimitz, Nimitz also chose Spruance's two principal subordinates for the upcoming operation. Specifically, that would be Richmond Kelly Turner, who Nimitz was trying to develop into the Navy amphibious doctrine leader, and Holland, Helen Matt Smith. And so both Turner and Smith were amphibious invasion veterans, not so much under fire, but yeah, some somewhat under fire, right? Nothing like what's about to happen. Uh, yeah. And Turner had in his hands in almost every had his hands in almost every invasion thus far in the Pacific. And Smith had trained for most of his adult life in amphibious operations, Seth. And, and it should be noted, you're 100% right, and it should be noted, too, that both Richmond Kelly Turner and Holland, uh, ha bleh, Holland Smith were personal friends of Admiral Raymond Spruance. So while, so while Nimitz chose uh, Spruance's subordinates, there is no doubt that Ray Spruance had his fingers in that and said, I want these guys, because he did. Uh, you know, he'd known these guys for years, specifically Turner, Kelly Turner. He'd known Kelly Turner for years and years and years, dating back to right after yeah, they, they got out of the academy. So they were close personal friends and, and he trusted Smith, them implicitly. Yeah. So for Galvanic, uh, Holland Mad Smith would have two infantry divisions in his hands, that being the Army's 27th Infantry Division, which was slated to land on Macon Island. Uh, and the 2nd Marine Division, which is what we're going to talk about, which was slated for Batio. Uh, a genuine concern was felt regarding the Japanese combined fleet. It was thought that Admiral Koga would commit the fleet once the invasions Macon and Tarawa Batio specifically would commence. Because of that, Admiral Turner raised his flag and sat nearer to Macon as it was closer to the perceived threat. Of course, the perceived threat is coming from truck. At least that's where we think that if the combined fleet sails to do battle with the with the Pacific Fleet, what is known now as the Central Pacific Force, it'll later become Task Force 58, Fifth Fleet, but that's another day. Um, it was thought that they would come from the uh, from the area of truck and that the first instances of battle would come on the side of Macon Island. Now, because of that, uh, Turner raised his flag, as I said, and, you know, and sat near to Macon. He had to have somebody subordinate to him to command and control the Batio operation, the Tarawa operation. Um, that was the Southern Attack Force, which was created by Turner for Tarawa and was commanded by a gentleman that we've never talked about before, but we will now and again later. That's Admiral Harry W. Hill. Admiral Hill is going to be the overall commander for the Southern Attack Force. He's going to be the man when it comes to decisions being made at the moment as Batio unfolds over the next 76 hours. Uh, to assault Batio, Holland Smith tabbed the 2nd Marine Division. Uh, the 2nd Veterans of the Guadalcanal Campaign were led by a gentleman named General Julian Smith. Uh, Julian Smith was 58 years old, had been a Marine Corps officer for 34 years, and was absolutely adored by his men who called him General Julian. Uh, he was from Elkton, Maryland, and he was a graduate of the University of Delaware and had seen action previously at Panama, Mexico, Haiti, and the Banana Wars. So a lot of times when we talk about Marine Corps officers at this stage in the war bill, we talk about Naval Academy graduates, but Julian Smith was one of those rare Marine Corps, you know, higher ups uh, who wore stars on his shoulder that was not from the trade school, as they say. Um, one one of the provisos set forth by the JCS for Tarawa was that the Central Pacific Drive had to be led by, quote, and I quote this exactly, battle-tested shock troops with amphibious yeah. training, Bill. 
the second division fit yeah, that they bill. Did. Didn't they? Um, and they were really the only unit that fit that bill. And you, it makes you wonder whether or not that's why didn't they just say <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the name this unit, right? The first Marine division was slated for Cape, Cape Gloucester in December. The second division, veterans of the Guadalcanal, and replete with both cadre and new men, were in New Zealand undergoing training and R and R following the canal. So after meeting with Spruance in early August, Julian Smith learned that his division would be assigned the spearhead of the new offensive and that the target would be Tarawa. So lacking real time for training, the second division would rely on its cadre of con canal veterans to lead the upcoming landing. Um, among his cadre of leadership was his chief of staff, name's gonna sound familiar, one Red Mike Edson. Uh, okay, and so remind us again, Seth, where Edson kind of got his bones? Oh, Edson's, you know, he was already a legend by this time in 19, this is, you know, like you said, Bill, August, 1943, he was already a legend. He of course had been the first Marine Raider Battalion commander aboard, uh, you know, Tulagi and then later Guadalcanal, uh, Edson's Ridge, mm -hmm. hello, is named, you know, after the man himself. He was a Medal of Honor recipient for that action. Um, consummate leader, uh, he was your typical Marine Corps officer, uh, you know, People thought that this guy hung the moon because he had taken part in amphibious operations, Tulagi, Guadalcanal. You know, he'd made or, or participated in other amphibious and landings on Guadalcanal, Tassim, not the Tassim Boca Road raid, but other amphibious operations to that time. He'd had his fingers in a lot, and he was tabbed to be Julian Smith's chief of staff, as you said, Bill. And that was a blessing for Smith because Smith had not commanded a division before. Uh, commanded a division before this was his first large scale command in terms of you know a lot of guys. Uh, so he relied very very heavily on Red Mike to get the Second Marine Division again, as you said, with cadre and new guys up to snuff when it came to amphibious training. So Edson did that. He took great delight and training the 2nd Marine Division in New Zealand and some of the islands offshore New Zealand to get them ready for this very event. Uh, and, and a lot of the, well, you can't say a lot, all of the, the, the 2nd Marine Division's preparations for this relied specifically on Red Mike Edson and the people mm -hmm. underneath him, some of which are, most of which, frankly, are legends, not just for Tarawa, but in the Marine Corps as a whole, one of which is a guy instantly his name is recognizable with Taro Bill, and that's of course yeah, H. you know, so this is some of the field grade leaders would also take principal stage for the upcoming fight for Basio. And again, Colonel David Monroe Shoup would have an enormously heavy burden on his shoulders for the upcoming operation. Although he's untested as a leader in combat, Shoup was strong willed, ambitious, and fiercely loyal. He was, a, he was 38 years old at the time of Tarawa and had been a Marine Corps officer for 17 of those 38 years. He'd served in China before the war and briefly toured Japan in 1936. He'd seen very little combat so far, acting only as an observer on Guadalcanal with the Army's 43rd Infantry Division on Rendova. Shoup's limited combat experience made him a puzzling choice to command eight battalion landing teams at Basio but results would prove that he was the right choice. Now, interestingly, Shoup wrote in his diary, if you're qualified, fate has a way of getting you to the right place at the right time, though sometimes it appears to be a long, long wait, Seth. Yeah, and, and Shoup was, you know, he was, again, your typical Marine Corps officer. And again, like you said, Bill, you know, his actual lack of combat experience makes him kind of a puzzling choice. But uh, General Julian Smith firmly believed in Shoup. He, he could see that Shoup was a consummate leader, that he had a cool and steady head, that he could make decisions literally at the snap of a finger. He could figure things out without even necessarily having to be there. He knew the situation immediately. And all of those, and I do mean every single one of those attributes, is going to come to the surface as you know the the second marine division lands and fights for their lives on Basio in 76 hours david shoop was a godsend 
to the second Marine division was a godsend to the men who were ashore. And it is frankly, aside from the fighting men is probably the reason that this operation actually does mm -hmm. eventually succeed. However, he was not the only one. Uh, there is a guy who is, when you see a picture of him and video, and we're going to show that here in this now, uh, he just looks <laughs> like a badass because he was, and that's a gentleman named Henry Pearson, Jim Crow. Bill, yeah, tell us about so, Jim Crow. You know, the one major Henry Pearson, Jim Crow, a Kentucky native had been in the Corps since 1918. He was a Banana War veteran, which is probably why he looks so hardened, a combat veteran of Guadalcanal, the CEO of 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, was easily distinguishable by his waxed handlebar mustache, not quite uh, kosher these days, and his fiery personality. He was a shouter, but he had no problems berating Marines to get the job done. It was said that the men of 2-8 feared Crow, or Crow more than the Japanese. I call him Crow because of Admiral Crow. <laughs> That's how you pronounce his name, uh, former CNO and former Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff, sorry. But this, you know, Major Crow's leadership would be pivotal, pivotal at Red Beach 3. Now, but his XO had a very different personality, didn't he, Seth? He did. And, you know, when you got Crow, who is, you know, a screamer, a shouter, and is just, and, and, and that's not necessarily a bad <laughs> attribute to have at times. Uh, he is this fiery personality. His executive officer, who, who, by the way, he did not choose, was already in that slot when Crow took over, was a gentleman. He was a very bookish, nitpicking, bespectacled, bespectacled officer named Major William Chamberlain. Chamberlain was a former college professor. Uh, he irked the men beneath him to no end when he would tag men for small things like revoking liberty uh, for untucked shirts, unshined shoes, and little chicken shit, things like that, frankly. Uh, many men doubted whether the quiet college professor could equal the fiery leadership of Crow. Uh, Chamberlain, however, would assuage those doubts once he hit the beach. Uh, later described as, quote, a wild man in combat, unquote, Chamberlain would play a vital role in every single step of the way at Red 3. Uh, Chamberlain believed that the most important features in a man were character, honor, and integrity. And he would display all of those traits in spades on Batio. So, I mean, you're setting, we're, we're setting this up because these guys are incredibly important and they're not the only ones, but the combined efforts of these guys, Bill, Julian Smith, Edson, Shoup, Crow, Chamberlain, and, and hundreds of others like them, forged the 2nd Marine Division into an elite fighting unit, high in morale and in esprit de corps. They were proficient with their weapons. They knew their trade and were cocky, mm -hmm. and they were ready for battle. There were those shock troops with amphibious experience that the JCS called for. Armed with the latest infantry weapons, including the Garand, the BAR, flamethrowers, I think, you know, flamethrowers are going to emerge increasingly over the course of the war, and demolition men, the greatest weapon the Marines would bring into Batio would be their inherent aggressive spirit and drive to to not let any obstacles stop them and not let their buddies down in combat. Of course, you, the old saying is that you know, when you get in the heat of combat, you're not fighting for country anymore. You're fighting for the guy who's, who's alongside you. This, in the 2nd Marine Division, the JCS did indeed get their battle-tested shock troops, Seth. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. These guys are... are they're going to be, this is where they forged their, their legacy right here are on the white sands of Batio. Um, now, while, you know, the Marines are obviously a very important part of this operation, uh, we got to talk about the people that they're going to be fighting mm -hmm. against here, Bill. And of course, that's obviously the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese ashore in Batio are led by a gentleman named Rear Admiral Shibazaki Keiji. Uh, Shibazaki was, as I said, a Rear Admiral who'd been assigned to Batio in September of 1943. Prior to this assignment, he'd served on various vessels. You never heard of this guy before, but he is, again, his name is inextricably tied to Batio for the reasons we're about to hear. Um, prior to Pearl Harbor, Shibazaki was a veteran of amphibious landings in China and in the late, in the late 1930s. And his firsthand experience in those landings told him that making an, amph an, 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 an amphibious assault 
against a fortified beach was a very tricky proposition. It was not something that was easily done. And he also knew because of that, that an amphibious force, when it lands in those first couple of hours after they hit the beach, that is when they're the most vulnerable. So as such, he wanted to make sure that his men on shore, ashore on Batio were ready to repel that landing as soon as these guys hit the beach. Now, Japanese defenses in the Gilberts, specifically Batio, were ramped up following Evans Carlson's disastrous make an island raid in August 4, 1942. That's what, exactly what you said, Bill. Thanks to Carlson's raid, and I'm being extremely sarcastic here when I say this, the Japanese realized that the defenses in the area were significantly weaker than they should be. They also realized that the Americans were going to attack again through this area at some point. Uh, the Japanese were also aware the U.S. is war of uh, the United States war plan orange, so it wasn't like it was some top secret, you know, plan. The Japanese knew full well what or war plan orange was; that it was a thirty-year-old plan, and they fully expected the United States to adhere to that, which of course they do. And that strategy, the war plan orange strategy, saw the Gilbert Islands as taking a strategic point as the war progressed, which of course it does. So the United States invading the Gilbert Islands, specifically Batio, was not necessarily a surprise to the Japanese. So as early as October 1942, plans were made to beef up the defenses yeah, on Batio. They were. They and now the interesting thing, of course, is that the def the Japanese defending Batio were actually Navy. There were the 6th Yokosuka Special Naval Landing Force, and a lot of people consider them the equivalent of Japanese Marines, but they were sailors. They arrived in Beishi under the overall command, as, as you said, Seth, of Admiral Sakura Tom Tominari, who was an engineer. He was an engineer. And so what does he do? He does what engineers do. He makes things stronger. And while um, Sibazaki gets the lion's share credit for Japanese defenses on Beishio, it was actually Tominari who began the construction of these networks of pillboxes and placements and built the strategy for the island's defense. Now, it was an extremely hardened defensive structure. The only thing it really lacked was defense in depth in modern defensive you know, doctrine. So Tominari's primary goal was to stall any American attack on the beaches and wear it down through attrition to the point of weakening it and making it more likely to be, to be destroyed in a typical Japanese night infantry, bonsai-style counterattack. An October 1942 directive against American landings stated, your job is to knock out the American landing boats with mountainous gunfire, tank guns, and infantry guns then concentrate all fires on the enemy's landing point and destroy him at the water's edge, Seth. And if you look at the defenses on Tarawa, and, and the Navy did a complete study of this after the event, that was exactly what the entire defensive structure of the island was designed to do, was to destroy the American invaders at the water's edge. And they damn near do. Uh, pillboxes, firing positions, trenches, all interconnecting with wide open fields of fire over the beaches lay in front of the attackers for a period of nine months. Mostly Korean and Chinese laborers worked tirelessly to create the defensive network on Beishio. Uh, large coastal guns purchased from the Brits. Now it was said, you know, there's a rumor and there's a myth that says that the, that big eight inch guns that were on Beishio were captured from the, from the Brits in Shanghai or, or yeah, I think it was Shanghai or whatever, Singapore, I'm sorry, Singapore. That's a myth. That is not true whatsoever. These guns were purchased from the British long before World War II ever started. Um, they were purchased during the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, these eight inch guns were brought to Beishio and installed in concrete block houses and concrete positions as anti-heavy shipping guns. Uh, I mean, an eight inch gun is what's carried on heavy cruisers in the American Navy and the Japanese Navy. So these are not, you know, some pop gun. These are some significant pieces of artillery here. Um, these guns were designed and in place specifically to fire on landing craft and support ships offshore. Uh, many Japanese emplacements were made from reinforced concrete. Others were made from what Bill was talking about a minute ago, a minute ago, coconut log bunkers with sand piled on top. And while that doesn't sound like a formidable op a piece of opposition, it most certainly is. Uh, you know, 16 inch naval rifles is, you know, the heaviest thing in our armament when we're shooting at, at, at an onshore target. And you would think 
that the 16 inch round, you know, that can destroy battleships and, and ships of, a, of that ilk could easily penetrate, you know, a Japanese bunker and on a concrete bunker to, to a point they actually can. But when those bunkers are dug into the ground and there's coconut logs, but, you know, three, four, five feet of sand piled on top of them. And there were 16 inch gun ain't going to do a damn thing as we're going to see. Um, Bill, if the Japanese de defensive plans had any flaws, and you touched on this just a second ago, is that it was designed to destroy the enemy at the water's edge, and it was not a defense in depth. However, because Beishio is so small, it's only two miles yeah, it's not long. It really doesn't yeah, matter, does it? The guards are so deep, there's no defense in depth because there's no depth. The island is too small. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you almost overrun the line if you can get through it. The problem is getting through it. But weapons, specifically automatic weapons of all calibers, they're all over this island. One unit that came ashore, the 7th Sasebo Special Naval Landing Force, again, sailors, brought the following. Four 75-millimeter 70, mountain guns, two 70-millimeter howitzers, four 75-millimeter AAA guns, two 37-millimeter anti-tank guns, eight Type 93 13 millimeter machine guns, 12 heavy machine guns, 27 light machine guns, 36 knee mortars, eight flamethrowers, four type 95 tanks. This is one unit, okay? So, and, and again, these, yeah. these, some of these guns are effective against ships and they're being used against landing craft and bodies. Any surprise that they were so good in this defensive action? Yeah, uh, no, it shouldn't be a surprise at all. And I mean, you know, the, the sheer amount of automatic weapons, you know, this is Shibazaki's role here, you know, and when Tominari was the one that designed all the defensive network, Shibazaki was the one that was like, I need machine guns and I need them by the boatload because he was fully aware that, you know, massed automatic weapons fire is going to inflict horrendous casualties on any invading attacker. And, and that's exactly what they do. And veterans of the Tarawa campaign, veteran, veteran Tarawa campaign, veterans of Batio specifically will consistently say that there were more machine guns on that damn island than they saw for the remainder of the war. Now, Bill, you, you talked about the Special Naval Landing Force, and we need to get into that because, as you'd mentioned earlier, there's a misconception that they were Japanese Marines. And, and that misconception comes from the fact that our Marines called them Japanese Marines. But they were not. They were not the same type. They were similar, but they were not the same type of animal as the United States Marines. They were not the same breed of cat, as John Parshall likes to say. Uh, 4,601 Japanese were ashore on Beishio awaiting the Marines. Some 2,571 of these are described, or what is called Riko Sentai. Uh, the Riko Sentai have often been described as Japanese Marines, similar to their American counterparts of the same name. Known as the Special Naval Landing Force, the Riko Sentai were not a Marine force. Instead, they were sailors, as you said, Bill, that had specific Heavy infantry yeah, they training, did. didn't they? Uh, American Marines and Rico Sentai fought each other before, notably at Wake Island in 1941 and Tulagi in August 1942. Remember, the ra Raider Battalion went ashore in Tulagi. Red Mike classified the Rico Sentai as Imperial Marines, the best, we've, the best they've got. That's what they were described as. By 1942, the Imperial Japanese Navy sported some 50,000 Rico Sentai in its ranks. The 7th Sasebo Special Naval Landing Force defending Tarawa was a new unit per se, but its ranks were filled with China veterans creating this new unit. By 1943, however, the Special Naval Landing Force were not what they had initially been developed to be. Closer in relation to Marine Defense Battalions, the SNLF included anti-boat, and field artillery units plus service troops trained to handle any and all weapons. The Riku Sentai were proficient with any weapon in the Japanese naval arsenal. They were cross-trained for everything, Seth. And they were spoiling for a fight. They were ready to go. Uh, the Riku Sentai on Beishio specifically were ably led, uh, thoroughly trained, skilled in camouflage, and imbued with the typical, albeit maybe more so, Japanese fighting spirit. I mean, these guys literally did not give up. You know, we constantly talk about 
we, we have talked about the Japanese will to fight and their lack of will or desire to surrender. You haven't seen anything yet. I'm just going to say that for, for the listeners and watchers of this show, remember the fanatical Japanese resistance on, you know, places like Guadalcanal and New Georgia and Bougainville. You ain't seen nothing yet. Just wait. So Riko Sentai, machine guns, coastal guns, pillboxes, and a web of defenses helped instill confidence in the Japanese. They were confident that they could hold the Americans on the beaches. Shibazaki was confident that his men could do that very thing easily, frankly. Uh, his hopes hung on the assurance, too, that from the, the assurance from Admiral Koga that if he could indeed hold the Marines on the beaches, the combined fleet would sail and annihilate the American sh ships offshore if he could only hold them on the beaches. And, you know, Bill, you talked about it, but I mean, Bay Shio's, you know, two miles long by 800 yards long or 800 miles wide. It, it's a small area. And there were the amount of automatic weapons that you just spit out here just a second ago. There were so many friggin' machine guns on that island and so many fortifications and emplacements and, and fighting spot, fighting positions that almost every single square yard of Batio was covered in some sort of automatic weapons crossfire. And we cannot make this point, you know, can't hit this hard enough. The amount of automatic weapons on this island is mind boggling when it comes to other locations that we're going to talk about even after this. This was a beehive. It was going to be like walking into a friggin' buzzsaw. Yeah. <clears throat> it was. So, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. No, I was going to say, you know, we, we've described the defenses. We've described the the offensive, uh, you know, plans and, and the setup to this thing. Let's get down to the to, to the countdown. You know, we're, we're like we said, we're going to break this into three episodes because it's so important and it's so harrowing. But let's talk about the fleet that is being sent there. You know, we talked about the lack of transports, the lack of cargo ships and, and the like. However, the one thing we did not lack at this stage in the war is warships, is it, Bill? I mean, talk yeah, about the fleet that's going over here, man. How this many is the thousand big defenders? Fleet. Was it 4,000 defenders on this island? Or something like that? Yeah. Ish, yeah, so, yeah, give or take, yeah. Four, yeah, what we got here like to... Uh, we did not underestimate the enemy here. We're bringing 17 carriers, 12 battleships, eight heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, 66 destroyers, and 36 transports loaded with two full infantry divisions heading towards the Gilberts, okay? Intel was constant for the Americans. As the fleet sailed toward Batio, they were updated with aerial images taken by 24 B-24s all the way until D-2. The aerial images showed the mines offshore, the machine gun emplacements, literally everywhere as well as the beach obstacles and the trenches all over the island. Sh larger artillery positions were noted by Colonel Shoup, who was aware of the defenses, but resigned to the fact that they had to be taken regardless. Big guns could, could and would be knocked out. What concerned Shoup was the abundance of automatic weapons, particularly at the water's edge. He knew that the machine guns would reap a devilish harvest amongst his men if they survived the supposed greatest naval bombardment in history, Seth. Yeah, and, and we got to talk about this, and we're, and we're going to go into significant detail on the naval bombardment in the next episode when we talk about day one at Tarawa. But Bill says that <laughs> with great sarcasm because it doesn't pan out <laughs> to, to what it's supposed to be. But that being said, it, at that time, to that point, was the greatest naval bombardment in history. Uh, prior to the landings, and, and there, there's a lot of argument that goes on back and forth here between uh, you know, the people directly involved with this operation specifically. Prior to the landings, Colonel Shoup and Red Mike Edson proposed a naval bombardment that would last days as opposed to the hours they would actually receive. Uh, Julian Smith took these proposals to Pearl Harbor in October, expecting a positive response. Uh, realizing the threat of a Japanese counterattack via the sea, he, Julian Smith was aware that there was the, the potential that the Japanese could counterattack via the sea. He was absolutely floored 
when he was told that Sinkpack, Nimitz himself, said that the preliminary bombardment of Beisha would be three hours long and no more, period. That absolutely blew his mind. Nimitz claimed, and, and look, we're all a fan yeah. of Nimitz here on this show. That's blatantly obvious. But the man is not without fault. Uh, he isn't Christ. And, and he claimed that strategic surprise would be lost in a prolonged bombardment and that his concern was with the combined fleet, not with Batio itself. The Second Marine Division would not, should, quote, should knock Batio out in short order without prolonged bombardment. And on top of that, Holland Smith told Julian Smith that the 6th Marines, a regiment within the 2nd Marine Division, would be held as Corps Reserve, meaning that Julian Smith and his assault force would be without one full regiment for however long Holland Smith felt mm -hmm. like holding them. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's building up to this huge operation, but as we get closer, it's already shaping up to be a disaster. Yeah, and and again, if we can unpack that timing of the bombardment just a little more and give a little bit more credit to him, you know, yes, his, his yes. thought was you start the bombardment, the combined fleet starts moving in your direction. If you if you're still bombarding two days later, they show up. And so whether it's submarines or the combined fleet itself, and then the Marines die when the ships are sunk. So, I mean, that's the kind of, to, to give them a little bit of credit, right? 2020 hindsight, the bombardment should absolutely have been more robust than it was, no, no doubt at all. But these are the fears that are going through their mind as they say, look, uh, you got three hours. Now, three hours clearly was not enough. I mean, we were gonna, nobody's going to suggest that it is. But again, these, these are the thoughts that are going through their head. So now the second Marine division is compelled to make a frontal assault on a fortified beach with an abbreviated bombardment, bombardment minus an entire regiment and facing an enemy with a 1.6 to one ratio of attackers to defenders. You know, we've said this before, Seth, that Sun Tzu said, if you're gonna be successful in your attack, you need to outnumber the defenders five to one. That's kind of a, Thumb, no, thumb rule, you know, is it always true? No, of course, because it's nonlinear in modern warfare, combat aircraft count, other, other factors go into that five to one ratio. However, 1.6 to one isn't a good number at all. No, and it, it, that's not going to cut it. And, you know, because we talked about it just a few minutes ago, Bill, when we said that, you know, Shibazaki was fully aware that the troops that are making an amphibious landing, they are at their most vulnerable state when they are making their way to shore. I'm not necessarily talking about being in the landing craft or the LVTs or whatever the case may be. I'm talking about like, you know, getting from the water's edge to, in Basio's case, the seawall, that if, if you can knock out, you know, a couple of hundred, several hundred people in, in short order, you're going to even those odds pretty, pretty quickly. And when you've got guys that are, hanging out in, you know, coconut log bunkers, concrete, uh, you know, bunkers and, you know, block houses and what have you that already have a will to fight literally to the very end, your chances of defending and repulsing this landing are very, very, very good, as we will see. Um, Julian Smith was convinced that he was walking into a disaster, Bill, and he does something here, and this is documented, he does something here that is very, very rare for a commanding officer to do, much less a Marine right. Corps commanding officer to do. He requests, he, tell us about this. He Bill. wants his lay, orders lay to show that the decisions on the, on the abbreviated bombardment and the withholding of the 6th Marine Regiment were against his best judgment or not his decisions. And yeah, he's, he's covering his ass here, but it proves to be completely accurate. And, you know, again, spoiler alert, this is not going to go well, Seth. No, it is not. He, he was so convinced he wanted to be absolved of the responsibility for the mm -hmm. landing plan. Um, his battle plans had been discarded. His, you know, the commanding officers, battle plans had been discarded. He'd been assigned a task that, as Julian Smith later admitted, was doubted could be done by others, quote, higher in rank than he, than course, he was referring to himself. He's talking about that there were people above him, Holland Mad Smith being one, that doubted the that the assault could be done 
A, in a timely manner, and B, in a successful manner. No kidding here. His desire for his orders to be written down was so that history would not crucify him for being the general most responsible for the slaughter of his own troops. That's... This is not shaping no. up to be a good thing. And aboard the transports headed for Tar Tarawa, the Marines are confident. They don't understand the uh, decisions that have been made. They, they don't understand their, the, the commanding general's uh, reluctance. You know, that's all hidden from them. They're ready for action. They're more than ready to take on Shibazaki's men. One of the Marines was a combat cameraman named Norm Hatch. So Seth, tell us a little bit about Norm. So Norm, I knew Norm. I knew Norm for many, many years. I knew a bunch of Tarawa veterans, but Norman Hatch always sticks out in my head because he was staff sergeant at this time uh, at, at the Tarawa operation, operation. And of course, Norm Hatch and Tarawa are much like the reef and the tide of Tarawa are inextricably linked because he and his combat cameramen, of which I believe there were only two others, one of which names was Kelleher, who was with, or Kelly, as he called him, was with Norm the entire time. Norm, document, Norm and Kelleher documented 95% of what you see uh, at Tarawa, which we're going to show all, or at least the vast majority of the footage um, in these you know, corresponding episodes as we go down. Norm Hatch was a combat cameraman, as you said. He was a regular Marine. You know, He was not a civilian. He wasn't AP or anything like that. He was a United States Marine. Uh, he had been training for this his entire career to this point. He'd been in the Marines for several, several years. Um, he was trained for combat just like any other Marine was. Um, and he decided, I remember him telling me, he said, you know, when I was assigned this opera, he actually requested to go on this operation. And when he was given approval to do so, he said, you know, I want to be on the front. I want to be with the men that are going to make this landing. So he sat back when he was assigned in the second Marine division and tried to figure out which guy was going to get into the most trouble. <laughs> Cause as he told me, he said, you know, once I figured out who's going to be around the most action, who's going to get into the most trouble, that's where I wanted to be because that's where I was going to be able to make a photographic record of this event to show the people back home. And we'll get into with the Marines at Tarawa and why it's so important later, um, what the Pacific War is really like. So when he sat and, you know, looked at all the battalion commanders, he picked out one guy. And of course, that's Major Jim Crow. He walks up to Crow and or walks into Crow's office and he says, uh, you know, Major, I'm, I, I would like to accompany you ashore uh, at Batio. And uh, Crow looked at him with a very uh, discerning eye, kind of stared at him. And he says, I don't want no damn Hollywood Marine with me. Get out of here. They told him, said, no, you know, he says, because you're just going to be a liability with your camera. You know, I, no. And Hatch, he stood back and he told Crow, he said, he said, you know, I'm a Marine, sir. He says, I, I'm a Marine. I'm a staff sergeant. I've been in the Marines for, I, at that point, I think it was eight years. And he says, I know what to do. I've been trained with weaponry. I, I know exactly what I have to do if the, if the situation gets down to it. It's important for me to document this history because we need to tell the people back home that the Pacific War is not some cakewalk, that this is, this is significant action. And I can help you get that point across if you let me go with you. And he said that Crow kind of stared at him for a minute and gave him the gave him the gave him the stink eye, and and then looked at him. He said, "Fine, just stay yeah. the hell out of my way." So, so Norm Hatch is is going to ride with Jim Crow in the LCVP on the way to Red Three, and he's going to document literally some of the most famous images of the entire war, not just the Pacific War, the entire war as a whole. And you're going to see it all throughout mm -hmm. these episodes here. So, Bill. The, the ships sail from Pearl. Uh, the, the second Marine division sails from New Zealand. Everybody starts meeting up and they're heading for Batio. Uh, the fleet is huge. As you were talking about biggest fleet put to sea in the Pacific by the United States to this point. And, uh, you know, it's only going to get bigger after this. Um, the fleet arrives off of Batio shores. The men begin to get into their landing craft, the LVTs and the like. The landing is on, and there was nothing that was going to stop the Marines from landing. Succeeding is another issue, but landing mm -hmm. was a definite, yeah. right, Bill? And the Japanese sight the ships, and their revelry was at 0200. Everybody was awakened as soon as the ships were sighted. Um, the attack at daybreak was expected. One Japanese survivor of the battle wrote what he had told his men. Let us exhibit our samurai spirit 
and try our best. The Japanese were more than ready to die at their posts if need be. And far back in the American Armada was the Maryland and USS Colorado. They trained their main batteries to port and prepared to open fire. Their 16-inch salvos from their massive weapons would signify the commencement of the naval gunfire barrage. The time drew near. The night before the landing, General Julian Smith was riding aboard the flagship of the Southern Attack Force, USS Maryland, and he sent a message to all of his Marines. And Seth, what does that message say? And this is verbatim. He says, and I quote, A great offensive to destroy the enemy in the Central Pacific has begun. American air, sea, and land forces, of which this division is a part, initiate this offensive by seizing Japanese-held atolls in the Gilbert Islands, which will be used as bases for future operations. The task assigned to us is to capture the atolls of Tarawa and Abimama. Army units of our 5th Amphibious Corps are simultaneously attacking Macon 150 miles north of Tarawa. Our Navy screens our operations and will, will support our attack tomorrow morning with the greatest concentration of aerial bombardment and naval gunfire in the history of warfare. It will remain with us until our objective is secured and our defenses are established. Garrison forces are already en route to relieve us as soon as we have completed our job of clearing our objective of Japanese forces. This division was especially chosen by the High Command for the assault on Taro because of its battle experience and its combat efficiency. Their confidence will not be betrayed. We are the first American troops to, to attack a defended atoll. What we do here will set a standard for all future operations in the Central Pacific area. Observers from other Marine divisions and from other branches of our armed services, as well as those of our allies, have been detailed to witness our operations. Representatives of the press are present. Our people back home are eagerly awaiting news of our victories. I know that you are well-trained and fit for the tasks assigned to you. You will quickly overrun the Japanese forces. You will decisively defeat and destroy the treacherous enemies of our country. Your success will add new laurels to the glorious tradition of our beloved Corps. Good luck and God bless you all. It is now in the hands of Providence and the fighting hearts of Marines. Yes, yeah, so these guys knew what they were getting God into, <laughs> and they understood the historic significance of what they were about to, to, to embark on. Um, and I, I could not have written a better message to send. You know, I just wonder, did he really believe? Uh, of course, he believed that they're going to succeed, but did he understand the degree to which um, his Marines would suffer losses, and that's going to come up uh, in our next episode. Absolutely. You know, I, to, to what you were saying, Bill, did he believe that his Marines would succeed? Absolutely, yes, he did. But you hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, when you said how many of those young men were not going to see the next 24 hours. And he was fully aware that the assault that his unit was going to make was going to be horrendous in terms of you know, a fight, you know, that, and we'll, we'll get into this. You know, there were a lot of, a lot of the Marines, the, the grunts, the trigger pullers, you know, they were confident that after specifically after the naval bombardment, they'd walk ashore. And as we are going to see next week, that most certainly did not happen. Bill, is there anything no, else you I, want to add to as this? As much as I think General Smith understood the, the difficulty and the challenge of the task that was set before him, I don't think he imagined in the slightest the impact this battle would have, thanks primarily to these combat camera crews that were coming ashore, the impact that this battle would have on the American psyche in the coming months um, mm -hmm. after the after the battle's completed. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100. percent You know, we're making a big deal. We devoted an entire episode to the buildup of this one operation because galvanic and specifically Basio influences, and we say this all the time, sound like a broken record, but this is the God's honest truth. Basio and the results of this operation influence everything going forward from like what you said, Bill, the creation of new units specifically designed to n not let these types of things happen again to new weapons, to new tactics and everything else are a result of what happens and the next 76 hours on the island of Basio. It's, it's incredibly important. And 
I feel, I don't know about you, but I feel like we've been building to this point, this entire season, this whole, at least I have, I, you know, this is, this is the, this is the linchpin. This is the inflection point we always talk about. So with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Wherever you receive your podcast, give us a rating and review. We would and certainly do appreciate it. If you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. If you have a question, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. I assure you we will pick up this story next week with day one on Bloody Batio. So once again, my name is Seth Parrott, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. And I'm Bill Bill. Toady. See you again next week.